Hello everyone, I am Lana Zak. Thank you so much for joining me. In any moment now, a historic space flight will launch from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. SpaceX's Inspiration4 is the first privately funded all-civilian orbital space mission. The four-person crew will spend three days orbiting the Earth, but it won't be just a pleasure cruise. For more on what they're doing and the mission, I want to bring in Garrett Reisman. He's a senior advisor for SpaceX and a professor of astronautical engineering at the University of Southern California. He also happens to be a former NASA astronaut. Garrett, thank you so much for being here. I love talking space. I want to get uh, your personal reaction just right off the bat to this mission. Did you ever think you would see an all-civilian space mission back when you were a NASA astronaut? There was very little hope of that, really, when back when I was an astronaut. Uh, but when NASA started this commercial crew program, this is exactly the result that they were hoping for, uh, an opportunity for not just a bunch of lucky government employees, but uh, for private citizens as well to fly in space. Gary, I want you to weigh in on something that, that some people have been pondering, whether or not, all, since you as an astronaut spent years in training, it was your profession, do you think that the title astronaut should be given to, uh, to people who are going up into space, contributing, uh, in, in this case, to history, uh, but haven't spent their life dedicated to being an astronaut? Getting ready for uh, I think in this case, when you have a crew that underwent a lot of training and actually have some interaction with the vehicle, it probably is a, appropriate. I think it might be a, a different situation when you're really just a passenger. Uh, but, uh, but we have a pilot and a commander on this flight, and I think they're deserving of that title. Well, we can see, our audience can see that they are all strapped in, ready to go. Tell us about the significance of this flight for the space industry and what it might mean for future space endeavors. Well, it really is the beginning of a whole new era where private citizens can go. And um, it's really a good thing for NASA. NASA did this on purpose. And the idea is that if you can launch, say, six dragons in a year or uh, seven or eight or nine or even more, then it's going to cost a lot less per flight. Uh, than just launching one or two for NASA. So NASA gets the benefit of defraying the costs, additional revenue streams. Also, every time we launch this rocket, we learn something and we can make it safer and we can make it better. And so NASA benefits from that. So there's a lot of benefits to NASA and the U.S. taxpayer from these private flights. And of course, just the excitement of other people getting a chance to go into space. You could definitely hear that excitement in the background there. Uh, tell us about the crew members. Oh, actually, I want to I want to pause for just a moment because we are seeing vehicles pitching downrange. The very first all orbital civilian crew launching right now. Inspiration four. Now setting the standard for civilian orbital space flight. Plus 30 seconds. Pullouts indicate nominal historic mission flying the Inspiration 4 crew. Onboard Dragon and Falcon 9. Late deal with the crew in the capsule. We're into the throttle down, into the throttle bucket. Okay, you do on throttle down. Throttling down in preparation for the period of maximum dynamic pressure. A minute in the flight. Nine, it's supersonic. Max stage one, throttle up. We're through the period of maximum dynamic pressure. We throttled back up and one Bravo, the call out from space. That's one of the abort sequences. That is a nominal call. Everything continues to be good. Looks like a smooth ride for the crew.
Merlin G engines are throttling down for G limiting. Four Gs, and we're holding it there for the crew. Major event coming up will be main engine cutoff, followed by stage separation, looking at the second stage engine nozzle, and then ignition of the second stage. And Miko. Stage separation. Officially, the Inspiration 4 crew are now on their way to space. First stage booster there on the left-hand side of your screen is making its uh, way back down to Earth. The grid fins have popped out to assist with the steering. It will be making a landing attempt on our drone ship. Just read the instructions, uh, which is parked out and holding position in the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, so we have a couple of views on Acquisition screen. Acquisition of signal, Bermuda. Uh, as Kate mentioned, left-hand side is a view from the top of our first stage looking down. That has already separated from the second stage, and it's making its way back to Earth. The velocity of the first Dragon stage SpaceX trajectory nominal. is being tracked on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. On the right-hand side of your screen is a view of our second stage Merlin vacuum engine. On the opposite end of the, that engine is the second stage and the crew, which sits on top of the second stage. Everything looks to be going Normal, uh, <laughs> normally uh, with them, um, and you can also track the velocity on the second stage on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. And we also have awesome views of the crew inside of their capsule as well. I'm pretty sure during first stage ascent, I saw Dr. Okay, Cyan Proctor. I'm pretty sure I saw Dr. Cyan Proctor give us two thumbs up. <laughs> yep. I'm sure she enjoyed this ride that she's been waiting for her entire life. Yes. Uh, one notable thing, too, is we're getting some twilight views. Um, the sun just set in Florida, but we're high enough um, uh, up where uh, the light around the horizon is also reflecting off of very high altitude objects, such as the first and second stages. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Love to hear that call out, trajectory nominal from the guidance Thanks, engineer. Also notice we're Really up there now, well past 100 kilometers. Acquisition of signal, New Hampshire. Just before that view switched, we saw some uh, teammate fist bumps going on there inside <laughs> of the cabin. <laughs> yeah, they look like they're having a fun ride there. Um, and their journey isn't over. We've got about seven more minutes until uh, Dragon separates from the second stage. Yes, uh, next milestone for this mission is actually going to be happening on the first stage. Um, it's going to be performing a re-entry burn that's going to be coming up around the T plus 7 minute and um, 30 second mark. Uh, that burn is used to slow down the first stage before it re-enters the denser parts of the atmosphere. Um, a few minutes later, it will execute a landing burn and make an attempt to land on our drone ship that's currently parked in the Atlantic Ocean. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Dragon copies. So far, sorry. I'm just going to say, so far, everything looking great for the Inspiration 4 crew, hearing that everything is proceeding nominally there with the second stage, which is what you see on the right hand side. That it, propulsion is nominal. I was just going to say that MVAC engine uh, we just heard now is looking nominal. About a minute left to go before the first stage performs its uh, first burn. And on your left hand side, looking at the first stage, you may see uh, those white. Extraordinary human possibility. I want to bring back in Garrett Reisman, a senior advisor for SpaceX, also an astronaut himself, to give us some context for the incredible images that you are seeing. Garrett, as someone who spent a significant amount of time in space, what is the ride like? What are they feeling at this moment? Well, boy, well, first of all, I'd like to summarize what you've seen so far. The context I would give you is so far, so good. Uh, you never fully exhale when you watch 
one of these launches until the engine shuts down and you're up in a safe orbit. But uh, but they're feeling a lot of G's. Uh, right before they stage, right before the, the first stage falls away and the second stage engine lights up that you're seeing glowing there on the screen right now, you get a big kick in the pants and, you, and you're up at about four or five G's. And now they're building up to about four or five G's once again. That's a lot. You know, in the shuttle, we only pulled about three. Uh, so they're pulling significantly more than that. And it feels like you got an elephant sitting on your chest, and it's 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 kind of hard to breathe. You have to work at it. Now, this crew um, uh, trained in the centrifuge, just like uh, we trained astronauts in the past, and, and the Russians trained their cosmonauts. So they knew what to expect. But that is uh, that is an, a unique uh, feeling. So these astronauts are currently on their way 360 miles above the Earth. That's actually, for our viewers, 100 miles higher than the International Space Station orbits. Tell us, why was this altitude chosen, selected for this mission? I think because they could, the Falcon 9 has the performance to throw the Dragon that high, and why not go higher? I think, uh, you know, the view is better. You see more of the Earth. Um, it's, it's not quite as high as the shuttle went when it went up to Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope. But I know from my friends that went up to Hubble, I, didn't, I just went to the space station. I never went to Hubble. But uh, my friends that did, did describe the view as significantly better. So I'm sure they're going to enjoy that. Plus, they have a really cool window that they get to look at it, so they're going to enjoy that as well. And I'm sure that there are people looking at this thinking how much they wish that they had one of those four seats. I'm wondering if you can tell us more about the crew. They really have, each of them brings an extraordinary piece to this puzzle. That's true. So, so Jared is the commander, and he's the one that really started this whole thing. He's footing the bill and, uh, and also raising a lot of money for a great charity, St. Jude Hospital. Uh, but he selected three people to come along with him, representing different uh, aspects. There's hope, generosity, and entrepreneurialism. Uh, so he picked hope. Uh, Haley Arsenault is a cancer survivor and is now a, uh, a physician's assistant at, uh, at St. Jude's Hospital. Uh, you have uh, Chris is uh, an aerospace engineer who, uh, who donated. So he represents generosity because he's one of the many people that donated to St. Jude's. And then um, uh, you have uh, Cyan Proctor, who represents the entrepreneurial spirit, because she does a lot of work with art and also education related to space. So he wanted to, to represent all those different things and really take advantage of this opportunity to not just go on a joyride, but really to reach a lot of people and, as the name of the mission suggests, inspire a lot of people. And it, it is so interesting. And, and uh, in the case of Dr. Cyan Proctor, uh, she came so close to going to space uh, multiple times. She's actually written a cookbook for Meals on Mars to that idea of sustainability living outside of, uh, of this blue marble. Um, but, but Chris, as I understand it, as you said, he—, he um, donated to St. Jude's. That's how he was able to enter into the lottery. But he actually wasn't the lottery winner. Somebody else won the lottery and gave him that ticket. Is that right? That's correct. And I, I find that really hard to believe. And, and in the case of Cyan, by the way, I was on the astronaut selection board uh, at the time that was choosing the astronauts that selection. Really? And I'm feeling pretty lousy right now because we passed up on Cyan. And <laughs> I'm thinking now maybe that was a big mistake. <laughs> you know, it's hard to get it right. What can I tell you? You know, in this case, though, she is making history in a different way. So, so maybe the plan was just bigger than that particular moment. Don't beat yourself up too much. Um, tell us about the training. They trained for the past six months. Tell us how that training entails. Um, tell us about the training that you went through as an astronaut that they weren't able to receive since this was more of a compressed time period. Well, the, as far as training for the Dragon and, and, and for operating the Dragon as the commander and the pilot, they really went through almost exactly the same training that we give to the NASA astronauts, including Bob and Doug and uh, that flew the first crew mission on Dragon and the other astronauts that came after them. So they went through the, 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 the ringer, uh, really. And But they did a lot more. And I credit SpaceX and in, in the Inspiration4 uh, team for really building in a lot of these other training events that are very important that they don't have the opportunity to do. And those are things like like getting in that centrifuge you just saw on your screen, uh, flying military fighter jets, going and climbing mountains. Uh, these are all really important bonding experiences because when they got into that capsule just a little while ago, a few hours ago, uh, that's a scary thing to do on your own. But if you're doing it as part of a team that you've bonded with, it feels like your family and you're all doing it together, 
it's a much different feeling and it's it's uh it's much easier to put that seatbelt on and and uh, strap in Garrett, as you could probably tell, um, I love the possibility of, of space, future space travel. And I know that the goal of SpaceX and other companies like Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic is ultimately to make space more accessible to more people. But what needs to happen in order to actually achieve that? And, and when we're, what are we talking in terms of time frame and actual accessibility? In this case, yes, they're all civilians, but, but it's being bankrolled by a billionaire which, you know, great on all of them, but, but that doesn't mean that folks like me or anybody watching are necessarily going to space anytime soon. Yeah, you know, we really do need to get the price down. <laughs> I think is that there's a number one thing we need to do. Uh, and I think we might have overhyped this, oversold it a little bit by saying this is the, this opens up the space to everybody. The truth is it opens up space to mm -hmm. people with the means to afford it uh, or, or, the, or lucky people that get chosen to go along. Um, you know, it's going to be a while, but, but, but it's so we have to be patient, I guess. If the price will come down, the opportunities will get will get there. Remember, it wasn't that long ago that flying on commercial airliners was was for the elite. They're the jet setters, you know, the Frank Sinatra sang songs about it, uh, jetting off to Rio for their vacations. This was not your ordinary citizen didn't have a chance to fly commercially. Today, we have Southwest, we have JetBlue, you know, we have Ryanair, and everybody that wants to go can go. We're going to get there in space. It's not going to happen this year. It's still going to be the, the realm of billionaires, but one day it'll be the realm of millionaires. And then eventually, uh, you know, I really think that we're on a trajectory that's going to get it into the realm for everybody. Well, Garrett, one final sentence for everybody watching and experiencing this with us. Uh, I, I just hope that the, the, the best thing about sending people up in space is the feeling that people get uh, by living vicariously and seeing what this experience is like and relating to it. And I hope that after today that it's even more relatable. And so I really hope that uh, that it lives up to its name. And, and a lot of people out there watching are inspired. I know my kids are. They're watching in the other room. <laughs> my kids are watching, too. Garrett Reisman, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.